very glad to know you're still with us. My guest is still in the studio, and uh, before we went to that break, we were talking uh, still on food sufficiency. Let's take a look at the border closure. She mentioned that that has compelled Nigerians to uh, consume locally, manner, and that we are held here as a result of that uh, border closure. And uh, let me see, she, she said that's not going to end anytime soon. Um, has this border closure translated directly to benefits to Nigerians? Let me take that question to you. Well, the, the border closure is supposed to be um, a, a compelling way of um, readdressing our economic reality uh, to, for us to look inward and then develop our own strategy using our own locally made goods to advance, just like uh, the Chinese did some years ago, and it paid off. Uh, but what we did not do that the Chinese did was, we didn't prepare for this. I mean, government just woke up one morning and said, they're going to shut all the borders. Yeah, but they, they will and say it, it seems like that to Ross, but that was not what happened, that it no, went through, they no, no. did a lot of thinking and planning. They did, yeah, they did a lot of thinking and planning, but you know, government is not in charge of the production of food. The production of food is private-based businesses. Government don't fund agriculture in large scale, just like they do in the U.S., where they ask you to just go and grow anything, go and rear any kind of animal, so long as it's legal, and then the government will buy them off, okay, and then subsidize it. The, the Nigerian government don't have that strategy. What they do here is they bring fertilizer, subsidize it and it only get to people who know people who know people in government so we don't have the strategy that they have over there so when you want to copy from another country what they have done you are not looking at your own peculiarity so the overnight issue was not a very good one and they're coming to the said goods the locally produced goods you see we don't have the scale what you have is subsistence farming. The grandmother and the grandfathers in the villages who have been chased away by banditry and insurgencies are the ones we are relying on to feed 200, uh, how many million of million, us? Yeah. We don't, I don't know that 200 million or 180 million, depending on who you ask. We don't even know our size. So I don't know how they arrive at sufficiency because you don't know the size of this country in terms of human capital. So sufficiency should not even come at all. You have to, first of all, get the figure. So okay. we'll come to that. Then we'll look at then the, the goods that are led to be goods that are smuggled into the country. How many of these items that come into the country do we grow here, apart from rice and maybe sugar cane for sugar and which other ones? There are a lot of items that we don't grow here. So instead of closing the border totally, I would have thought that they would place embargo on some goods not to come in and allow those ones that we don't grow here to come in so that people can still have access to those ones. Yeah, I see you want to add it. Folks. Yeah, I mean, it's not, for me, it's, even if you, it's, we, we seem to have this idea in Nigeria that once we do things like we ban, we close the borders, we do these things, we, I think we should start to look at allowing market forces to determine certain things. Consumers are not going to want to pay more money for something they can get cheaper. It's, it's, that's, that's just basic economics. So if the um, imported rice is still coming in, let's assume, that this, these are just random figures, let's assume the imported rice costs 10,000 naira. If a bag, if the same rice, the same quantity of rice, a bag of the Nigerian one costs 15,000 naira, any normal person would buy the foreign rice. But if that Nigerian rice costs maybe 8,000 when the foreign one costs 10,000, you don't need to close any borders to get people to buy the Nigerian rice. It's, it's, it's just basic economics. Nobody wants to pay more for anything. But it's, it's that simple. So this idea, I mean, to use, to use a non-agricultural a non example, there was this thing, I think last, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, there was this controversy on social media about the kind of car that the Big Brother winner 
got. And they, uh, I think they said it was, was it 20 million, 25 million Naira or something like that. And the, a lot of people were saying, why would a car like that produced locally or manufactured locally cost that amount of money? And I looked at a picture of the car and it didn't make any sense to me. I would love to drive a made in Nigeria car, but if, I, <laughs> if I'm going to spend 25 million Naira on a car, it wouldn't be that car. So no, it was a gift. So yeah, no, no, I get that. But the, no consideration. No, no, no. So I'm, I'm not even. Talk, I'm not talking about the giftedness of it. I'm talking about the cost, the cost of, the of the car, because if you give someone 25 million naira today and tell them to buy a car, any car they want, there is no way on this planet they are going to buy that car. It's that simple. Because if first of all, if you compare it to the uh, to similar cars in its in its in its either its size its engine capacity those sorts of things mm -hmm. then you, ha you have to ask the question how much do those cars if how much does a mercedes-benz a bmw and audi those kinds of cars in that class how much do they cost in and in some cases someone did an analysis the nigerian one actually costs more which to me <laughs> makes no sense so it's oh. the same principle here why why are things that we're making locally costing more. That, that's the part of it I don't get. And for me, it doesn't make sense because if you can drop those prices, then you don't need to do any, there doesn't need to be any special government intervention. Yeah, she, Once just, those just prices to interrupt drop, you quickly, yeah. because we, we, I'm sure. sure we have little time. Okay. She, she did acknowledge the fact that there will be some challenges with the border closure, but she, she expressed real optimism that the prices will crash very soon and that people should be Based hopeful. On what? Are you optimistic? Her. I agree with her on that. You know, when the demand is high, you are going to have that rush, mad rush, and that price will rise. Uh, normally, but you know our situation sometimes defy economic principles. When things go up, they don't come down again. When during the, the time the dollar went up, I remember I was in the market to buy yam and the woman was selling that dollar. dollar. <laughs> I mean, this is the yam you grow somewhere and all that. And then you, a lot of issues. But I think that it will come down when the insulation, when when the, the rush and the tension falls, it will naturally come down. Just to add to what he said, I think that the issue you talked about is if the cars, if you look at it, the um, raw materials for the production of those cars were not locally sourced. Yeah, no, I, know that. I know that. Okay, uh, I, I, need, I really need to ask again. you this before we leave. It's, both of you seem to not agree at all that we have uh, food sufficiency in this country. We still have a long way to yeah. go. So does it worry you that the people that seem to be leading mm -hmm. this country <coughs> and should know better seem like they're divorced from the reality of the food situation in the market? Honestly, I actually you can think... can say your concerns and your concerns, maybe yeah. 30, 30 seconds, so we can... I actually think they do know better. I don't, because at the end of the day, it, it, there's, with these things, there's politics involved. There's, there are political considerations when certain statements are made. I'm not saying that's exactly what it is here, but it's, that I believe that's most likely what it is, because I don't want to believe that anyone makes these kinds of statements without thinking it through to the point where you can say, okay, no, we're not there yet. But I can understand going out and saying we're there for, to be able to say we're doing something or we were keeping our campaign promises, those sorts of things. Well, I, I think that uh, it will take time before we come to that reality that we'll have this sort because the reason why these leaders are divorced from the reality is because of the wide gap between the earning capacity of the masses and the leaders. So the, the, the earning capacity of the leaders is too, too wide. They can afford things to think they are sufficient. And then from the flip side of it, the masses, we are supposed to be the one to evaluate the issue and tell them that given what we earn and given what we purchase, they, we are not in that level of sufficiency. You both have made very useful suggestions here, and I hope that somebody is watching and listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're not going yet. I'll be back <laughs> with you. But let's just go on a quick break. When we return, we'll be speaking on the 10 billion uh, Naira refund to Kogi State Government for works done for the federal government. Stay with us. <laughs> 